Our second reading comes to us from the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. I'm going to begin reading at verse 36, and I'm going to read on through verse 44. Let's listen now for the word of the Lord. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep away, therefore, for you do not Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief, the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Thus ends this, both the reading and the hearing of this God's holy word, this is the word of the Lord. When I was a teenager, our youth group took a trip to Six Flags Over Georgia. Now, that was back in the days just before the northern and southern branches of the Presbyterian Church reunited. Our youth group had formed a relationship with a youth group of a church in Anniston, which at the time in the old Southern church was in, this, was in the same presbytery with our church. So we went to Anniston for a few days. And one of the things we did while we were there was to go to Six Flags. Now, because we were so close to Anniston, less than two hours drive, we stayed at Six Flags until the park closed at 10 p.m. And as I was leaving the park, I was with a small group of people that was in the youth group. And we passed a restroom and I needed to go. So I went into the restroom and when I came out, the group was gone. So I went out to the parking lot to go to the van. And when I got out in the parking lot, all of the cars were leaving because it was closing time. Now, if you've ever been to Six Flags, you know how large that parking lot is. And it was nighttime. And from a distance, I spotted a van that looked suspiciously like our church van leaving the park. So, being a teenager and not thinking clearly, I started to chase it. I guess I thought I could run it down. I must have been a sight running across the parking lot going, stop, stop. Of course, I was probably a quarter of a mile away from it, so I had no chance to catch it. All I accomplished by that was to get myself turned around. When I finally gave up chasing the van, I realized I had no direction, no idea which direction to go or what to do. Well, I happened to find a little convenience store that was there in the parking lot. And I told them what had happened, and the manager said, Calm down, son. Maybe you were chasing the wrong van. It's okay. Where was your van parked? Well, I told him I didn't know exactly, but I knew that we were pretty close to where the group buses parked. So he said, Well, come on. We'll, we'll go get in my little truck, and we'll go over to where the buses are. And we did. We got in his little truck and we drove her to where the buses were and sure enough our van was there there was a happy ending to that story we went back to Aniston uh, I endured the ridicule of the other people in the group for a little while uh, and the story had a happy ending 
But for just a moment there, I had a real sinking feeling. I understood maybe for the first time in my life what it's like to feel that you're left behind. Some years ago, there was a series of books written with the title Left Behind. You may remember them. There were several books in the series. If you haven't read, uh, read them, they offer a view of the end times from a very evangelical perspective. These books were wildly popular in the day. And for a time, they started a lot of talk about the end times, which I think is what they were designed to do. There was a lot of talk about being left behind. I confess that I read a few of those books myself. My reaction to them is that they make a great story, even though I question some of the theological matter that they presented. The truth is that the end of times has been a popular subject, at least over the last 50 years, and I might argue since the beginning of the church. Some years ago, I was at First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Alabama, and we studied the Disciple Bible series, study series. It's a series that's put out by the United Methodist Church, but it runs through uh, the, entire, uh, the entire Bible. It's got a series of videos, and there's some other work, the group work that has to be done. <clears throat> and as we approached the Revelation lesson, I could feel the anticipation mounting. I could tell that the group really wanted to understand this book. Perhaps I wondered so that they could better prepare themselves for the end. I wonder if some of them were disappointed when the lesson presented the book as a picture of activities going on at the time that the book was written. The study took the stance that Caesar was the Antichrist and that the beast was the territorial governor. And that we weren't really talking about the end of times at all, but more of a critique of society at that time. I don't want to get into that too much because there are people, very dedicated Christians, who continue to believe that Revelation is a study of the end times. There are others who believe that it was a critique of the modern day. Um, and I don't want to get into it because I want to uh, point out um, because I think it is more important that the real phenomenon that's driving the interest in the apocalypse, I, the, the real phenomenon that's driving the interest in the apocalypse, I've often said that people are not rational creatures. We are instead emotional creatures who have the capacity to reason. We are each of us driven by our hopes, our fears, our needs, our desires. And we, re we reason out why we should act the way we do uh, to justify the actions that we've taken. If the truth be told, I think a lot of the interest in apocalyptic literature is because we are mortally afraid of being left behind. One thing... Um, all humans have to do, all of us, is come to grips with our own mortality. We all have one thing in common. All of us, every one of us, is going to pass one day. Every one of us. The fact is, none of us can escape it. But the good news in Jesus Christ is that we can look forward to an eternity of life beyond life, life in Christ. The fact is, it's easy to look at a passage like the one from Matthew that I just read and let your fear drive you. Oh my gosh, when's it going to happen? What am I going to do when it happens? In fact, that's one of the biggest objections that I personally have to the way that passages such as this have 
often been treated in the evangelical community. These apocalyptic passages. It's easy to present a passage such as this to someone in a way that's designed to scare the proverbial hell out of them. It's easy to do that. We can use a passage like this to get people to give their lives to Christ or else. We can tell them, if you'll just accept Jesus, you can avoid all of this. But I don't think that's the reason that Jesus tells this passage this way to his disciples. In fact, I think it's easy to confuse people if you present them with contradictory messages of who God is. How can the same God be the angry, judgmental, and vindictive God that wants to whack you and at the same time be the merciful and gracious God that wants to save you? Gee, that's an awfully confusing passage for somebody who may not know who God is. If you do that, it just sums up to zero if you present the gospel that way. They cancel each other out. But as I read this passage, I've come to believe that's not what Jesus was after at all. I think that Jesus tells this story as a way to prove a point. And the point is this. No matter what trials we must face in life, we are never beyond the love and saving grace of Jesus Christ. Ever. Ever. We can rest secure in the promises given us by God no matter what. We can rest assured that we will have a life in Christ Jesus. Now, I understand the fear of the end of times. I've understood it since I was a boy. I can remember asking my dad to take me to see a movie called The Late Great Planet Earth. You may have heard of it. You may have seen it. And I was a small boy when it came out. I was no more than seven or eight years old. And I can remember asking my dad what he thought about it. And he said, Dad, he said, son, you can look at a movie like that and decide that it's all true but there's nothing you can do about it. And you can sit here and shake or you can decide, you know what? I'm going to trust God that things are going to work out okay and I'm going to go on with my life. Some of the best advice I've ever had from my dad. I understand the fear of the end times. The descriptions here in front of us are horrible. But are they any more horrible than the reality that we face every day. It seems to me that there has been a mass shooting about every week for the past several years. We're just coming out of a pandemic in which more than one million people have died in this country alone. We're seeing a rise in devastating storms and wildfires around the world. Island countries in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean are literally disappearing due to rising sea levels. Famine is once again becoming a problem in some parts of the world, particularly in northern Kenya where it borders the desert. Our lives are difficult enough as it is. Surely fire and brimstone from the sky and plagues of locusts and frogs could be no worse. What would be worse than that? Having no hope. A loss of hope would be the worst thing that I could imagine. If, if we no longer had reason to hope. But we do have a reason. We need to have no fear. We do have a reason to hope. We need to have no fear because we belong to Jesus Christ who saves us. We need to have no fear because we've been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ for no other reason than that he loves us. 
we can't be left behind because the bus has already left the station and we're on it. We're on it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let us stand and say what we believe.